أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If we open the text to page 26, in this foreword, we are still discussing the history of Usul, how the science came into being, how it evolved, and how is it that it came after the science of hadith? and the science of Islamic law, which we call fiqh or jurisprudence. So, in the middle of this page, the author brings our attention to the historical fact that the companions of the Imams, especially at the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon them, they started to think at a deeper level you could tell from their questions. They were not asking simple questions, is this halal, is this haram? They were asking deeper questions and they would ask the Imams to teach them principles and laws. We gave a few examples. For example, if we have two conflicting hadiths, one says do this, the other says do that. What do I do in this case? And the Imams, peace be upon them, they would train their close companions, the very educated ones, those who were scholars, by giving them such important principles. For example, there's one hadith from Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, in which he says in this hadith, we the Imams, we give you the guiding principles, the common elements as the book calls them, and you branch out. You take these laws, apply them to different cases, and branch out. So we give you the pillar, and you branch out from it. So the Imams would give these principles, these rules in Islamic law, to their companions so that they don't have to come back to the Imam and refer to them for each single case. They could just use general principles and apply them to their cases and they would deduce Islamic laws, they would ex extract Islamic laws. So we see this shift happening at the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. So you see that in the middle of the page, the author says, those questions reveal the existence of the seeds of usuli thinking among them, the companions, and of a tendency to establish general laws and delineate common elements. When we say common elements in Arabic, they are called al-anasir al mushtaraka Common elements are those principles that these companions would constantly run into. When they would examine the hadiths and they would try to apply it to different cases, they would run into similar common principles or dilemmas or problems. For example, the conflicting of hadiths, that's, that's an example. You know, they would try to arrive at a solution to an Islamic law, they find you have conflicting hadiths. Some companions narrate this hadith from Imam al-Sadiq, other companions narrate a different hadith. So they begin to ask amongst themselves, what do we do in this case? Or when the Imam says, do ghusl of the Friday, اغتسل للجمعة, is this a binding command, wajib, or is this just a recommendation, mustahab? They would discuss this, the companions, because sometimes let's say they were not sure. We call these the common elements. The science of usul is these common elements. These common elements, we call them the science of usul. What are the common elements, the common principles that you need to apply Islamic law? One of them is 
the law of continuity, istishab. If you ever have certainty, then after you have doubt, what do I do in this case? The science of usul says, continue that certainty as we've explained before. Called the law of istishab. Inshallah later we will examine it in depth. So you see that the companions, not only were they thinking about these common elements at a deeper level, they would actually write books about that. An example is Hisham ibn al-Hakam was one of the famous companions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Hisham ibn al-Hakam, he was a theologian, he was a scholar, he was a legal expert. He wrote a book called Kitab al-Alfaz, a book on terms. When the Imams use different terms, they give different commands. What do these commands mean? Are they binding? Are they not binding? He actually wrote a book on that. This reveals how he was thinking at a deeper level. He was not only concerned with how you pray, what's halal, what's haram. He was concerned with principles. That when the Imam speaks to us, how do we understand his words? His commands, are they binding, are they not binding? If, for example, uh, the Imam uses a word in Arabic that I'm not sure. Is the Imam giving me a direct binding command? That's an obligation or not? An example in English, if the Imam says, you should not do this. This phrase, should not. Does it mean that it's haram to do it? Or it means it's makruh, unrecommended to, it, to do it. What would you say? If you go to an imam and he tells you, you should not do this. It's open to interpretation. Some people can consider it as a command, as a prohibition. Don't do it. Some people would say no. This expression usually, it's not a binding command. It's used for what? Preferred. It's preferred. It's something that is makruh or recommended. If the Imam says, you should do this. You should do it is another example. The Imam السلام, let's say he tells you, you should do this act. It could go both ways, right? Some of the obligations, you know, can you tell someone you should pray? It's the, it's the time for Salatul Dhuhr and your friend is not praying. You tell him, you know, you should pray. The same goes with the Quran and the Torah also. The same goes with the Qur'an, exactly. But at the time of the Prophet, people were really thinking at this level. Whatever they understood from the Qur'an and the Hadith, they just applied it. They weren't analyzing all these different expressions. So Hisham ibn al-Hakam, he actually writes a book on this. If the Imam says, you should do this, you should do, is that a legal binding command, wajib? Is it mustahab? Is it up to you to decide? What is it? So the point here is that the companions of the Imams, they were thinking at this deeper level where they would actually write books on it. Another example is Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, one of the great companions of Imam al-Sadiq He wrote a book called Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, the discrepancy or the difference of Hadith. He actually wrote a book that guides you what to do when you are dealing with two contradictory hadiths. How do you reconcile them? How do you resolve the difference? There was a book on that. You have another companion, Abu Sahl al nawbakhti another scholar. He authored a book called Al-Umum wal-Khusus, the general and the specific. Because this is one of the laws that we will discuss in the science of usul. If the speaker says, as an example, respect all scholars, all scholars, whether they're scholars of religion, they're scholars of literature, they're scientists, any scholar, respect them. This is a general statement, right? Then you have a specific statement that says, do not respect the philosophers. Let's say the speaker has an issue with philosophers. Philosophers, are they scholars or no? 
in the general meaning of scholars. Are they scholars or no? Yes. They're scholars. What do you do here? One hadith says, respect scholars, all scholars. One hadith says, don't respect philosophers. Initially there's a contradiction, right? Because philosophers are also scholars. So the first hadith that says, respect all scholars, also tells you to respect the philosopher, the scientist, the mathematician, the one who knows tafsir, the one who knows Islamic law, they're all scholars, right? So the first hadith, if you want to apply it, it's telling you to respect the philosopher because they're scholars. But then there's a specific hadith that says, do not respect the philosophers. Do not follow them, do not take their word, don't respect them. As an example. Initially I have a contradiction. Hadith number one says, respect them. Hadith number two says, don't respect them. What do you do in this case? This scholar, and no bakhti he wrote a book on this. That if you have something general, and something specific, and there is an apparent contradiction between them, how do you resolve the contradiction? Okay, but what's the proof though? Do you follow the specific in every aspect? In all cases or in some cases? It should be in all cases because it's a specific. Sometimes what you said, what you said could be correct, but sometimes we have examples where no. The specific cannot override the general. Where do you study that? In usul. In the science of usul, in legal theory, this is exactly what we study. In which cases do you take the specific and you have it override the general? And in which cases does the general stay? Another thing that our scholars mention, if the Quran mention, mention, mentions something general, for example, the Quran says the food of the people of the book is halal, right? And then the hadith comes and says, no, only the, for example, the grains, the non-meat products is halal for you to eat. But as for their meat, if they're not slaughtering it the Islamic way, then you can't eat it. The hadith is specific. The Quran says all their food is halal. The hadith says only this type of food of halal. What do you do here? Can the hadith, which is specific, override the generality of the Quran here or not? No. That's where we discuss it in usul. And scholars say yes. The hadith is a correct hadith, it can. Because the Quran mentions many general things. You get the specific from hadith. But this is a discussion. There are some scholars who say no. Any general thing in the Quran, I will not any allow I will not allow any hadith to specify it for me, to override it. So this is where we discuss it in the science of usul. And we see that the companions of the Imam towards the later Imams, they're thinking at this deeper level. And they're actually writing books on these subjects. The same example you mentioned yesterday that there are three rakats in Maghrib. Where does it come from? From Quran or from Hadith? So the Hadith overrules Quran. Over here you don't have contradiction because the Quran just says pray. The Hadith shows us how to pray. But the example that I gave you here with respecting the scholar and the philosopher, there's a contradiction. The general says because he's a scholar, respect him. The specific says because he's a philosopher, I don't want you to respect the philosophers. You have a contradiction. But scholars say in this case, the specific takes precedence and it overrides the general. Because that's how society works. In law, any court system, any constitution, any legal work, you make general laws and then you can make, you know, you can issue specific laws. That's fine. Let's say a university says that the tuition for the year 2017-18 is $10,000, general law. And then they make what? An exception. If you're a non-resident, you have to pay $20,000. Now this specific contradicts the general statement because the general statement says 10,000. It didn't specify for who, it's general. 
So if you take the generality of it, it means everybody has to pay $10,000. But then there's a specific law that says if you're a non-resident, if you're out of state, for example, you have to pay more. Now is there a contradiction between these two? Not really. Initially you, you could say there's a contradiction, but the specific takes precedence over the general. Now where do you discuss these details? How do you deal with the general? How do you deal with the specific? If you've got two specifics and a general, which one comes first? The chronology of it also is important. When was the general statement made? Was it after the specific or before the specific? Because you have all this in hadith. Where do you study all of that? In ilm al-usul. In mabahath al-alfaz. In the book that Nubakhti uh, authored. Al-am wal-khas. Al-umum wal-khusus. The general and the specific. So we see that the science of usul tackles all these common elements. Now this issue of the general and the specific, is it specific to any uh, book in Islamic law or it applies across the board? Is it specific only to the book of Salah? If you have hadiths about Salah and some of them are general, some of them are specific, then this is how you resolve the conflict or this applies in every field? What would you say? In every field, anywhere where you have a general ruling, and then you have a specific one, how do you reconcile them? This applies to every book of law, whether it's Salah, Hajj or anything else. That's why we call it a common element. This discussion of the general and the specific, Al-Anasr al mushtaraka we call it a common element. A common element is what we study in Usul. The law of istishab, it's a common element, the law of continuity. It applies in every field. So this is what usul discusses. Is, it, is, is that clear and the difference between it and Islamic law? And we mentioned some other differences uh, in the previous course. So we see that the companions of the Imams, they're thinking at a deeper level. Then in the following paragraph, in the middle of it, the author says, the study of these common elements did not become a separate study independent of jurisprudence until long after the birth of the first seeds of methodological thinking. He's saying while some companions were aware of these common elements, but usul did not really become a science at that point. It was still part of fiqh, part of Islamic law. You would discuss it in Islamic law. It was not a separate study. Yes, there were some books. Hishab ibn al-Hakam wrote a small book about it. Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman wrote a small book about it. But it was not separable from Islamic law. You still had only fiqh, and then you would have some discussions on these common elements. Later on, centuries later, after the time of, for example, scholars like Sheikh al-Tusi, did usul become a formal official science that you could clearly distinguish from fiqh and Islamic law. Now in the following page, in page 27, the author makes an interesting observation that the science of usul, because it was not a concrete science yet, it would be mixed with other sciences. Such as which science? Let's read. Until then, on the first sentence of page 27, usul had continued to waver between jurisprudence and ilm, usul ad din The science that we're studying now, legal theory, it would waver between fiqh and usul ad din theology, the study of Islamic beliefs. Thus, sometimes discussions on usul al-fiqh legal theory, were mingled with discussions on usul al-deen and kalam, scholastic theology. So in this page, the author explains that because usul al-deen also had the word usul in it, which means the principles of religion, and usul al-fiqh, 
legal theory also has the word usul in it, the principles of Islamic law. Sometimes these two would get mixed between each other. And therefore you found some discussions in theology, they found their way to legal theory because of this confusion. Which example does the author give here? The author gives an interesting example. In Usul al-Din, when we talk about Aqeedah, Islamic beliefs, theology, you need to have concrete proof, certainty, you have to have full Yaqeen for any belief that you want to have. You can't say in terms of the belief, the Aqeedah, hey I saw a hadith in this book and now I have this belief system. That's not enough. Why? What's the proof that's not enough? Because the Quran says, Dhan, what is dhan in English? Can someone translate dhan for us? Yaqeen is certainty. Shek is doubt. What's dhan? I'm sure you've heard the word dhan. What does dhan mean? Translate it for us. What kind of belief? See, if you're 100% sure about something, that's called yaqeen. If it's a 50-50 situation, it's called doubt. What if it's 80-90%? What do you call that in English? Estimated guess. Estimated guess, what would you call it? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Conjecture, maybe. A supposition, an assumption. If your skepticism is more in line with doubt, then is when you you're not sure, but you're 70, 80 percent sure. That's called then in the Arabic language. Is this what is Suspicion. Is this what is used when we discuss the doubts in the salah? Like yes, exactly. That's the word we use. You know, you're not sure you're in the third rak'ah or the fourth rak'ah, but you have suspicion. 80 percent, you're in the fourth rak'ah, for example. According to Islamic law, even though suspicion dhan is never proof, but in salah it's proof because the hadith says if you have doubts, you're in the third or fourth rak'ah. If it's a 50-50 doubt, then you have to consider yourself to be in the last rak'ah and then you have to do one rak'ah ihtiyat as, a, as a, you know, a, a precaution. But if you're 80% sure you're in the fourth rak'ah, you have no yaqeen, you have no certainty. But that 80% is good in salah. You can act upon it and you can consider yourself in the fourth rak'ah. If you have dhan, that you're in the fourth rak'ah. Now the Quran as a general rule states Dhan does not take you to the truth. Now you want to believe in the attributes of God let's say, the justice of God, infallibility of the prophets, the day of judgment, some details about the day of judgment, let's say some important details. Can you just grab a book of hadith and say, you know what, I read this hadith and I'm going to believe in this particular belief because of a hadith. Can you do that in usul al-deen? You can't. Why? Because when it comes to your aqeedah, to the Islamic beliefs, you need yaqeen. Dhan is not enough. The Quran says, Dhan is not enough. You have to have full yaqeen certainty. Why do I believe that God is one, that His attributes are this, that He's just, that He's sent prophets and messengers, that the Imam is infallible? Why do I have these beliefs? I have yaqeen. And that's why, by the way, when it comes to the pillars of faith, usul al-deen, there's no taqlid. You don't follow anyone. You have to have your own yaqeen that God exists and He's one about some of the attributes of God, the prophethood, imama, the day of judgment. These are things that we need to know. We need to know their proofs too. I can't say, oh, just because my marja says, you know, the day of judgment exists, then it exists. Or my parents say that the imams are infallible, then they're infallible. Most scholars say that's not enough. Because it's a pillar of faith, it's part of usul al-deen, you have to have yaqeen. 
So in usul al-deen, in aqidah, we have to have faith. Some early scholars, they got this concept and they applied it to usul al-fiqh. So they said any principle that you want to discuss, any common element you want to dis discuss in legal theory, you have to have yaqeen. One hadith is not enough, two hadiths are not enough. You need to have tens of hadiths so you're sure and you have yaqeen. The author says, why did this confusion happen? Because usul was not a separate science, legal theory was not a separate science, you had some principles from other sciences that found their way into usul. And hence, those early scholars of legal theory, they would tell you, okay, you want to discuss a principle in usul, such as the general and the specific, contradictory hadiths, and so on and so forth. What's your proof for that? Istishab, for example, the law of continuity. What's your proof for that? You will tell them, my proof, I have a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq He says, don't negate certainty with doubt. He's like, okay, just one hadith? I'm like, yeah, just one hadith, and it's a correct hadith. What would they tell you? That's not enough. You can't establish a principle in usul, in legal theory, just with one hadith. Maybe the narrator of the hadith lied, Maybe he was mistaken. Maybe there's another hadith that contradicts it and it never reached us. There's always room for doubt, right? So they would say, that's not enough. You could not discuss it. Nowadays, scholars say, no. If you have one hadith and it's authentic, it's enough proof. You can discuss it in legal theory and you could establish laws from it. Because it's proof between you and Allah, it's proof. It's not like usul al-deen and the aqidah and the belief in the oneness of God and the day of judgment and yawm al-qiyamah and prophethood such that you need full, absolute yaqeen. When we say the Prophet appointed Imam Ali السلام, as the successor, are we just using one hadith to support this? No, we have tawatur. We have successive narrations to the point of yaqeen that the event of Ghadir happened. See, that's part of usul al-deen. I can't say Imam Ali is Khalifa, oh, just because there's two hadiths about that. Well, they could be wrong, these two hadiths. How do you know? But when you have hundreds of hadiths about a subject, your mind tells you it's impossible that all these different hadiths are wrong. Okay, one hadith could be wrong, second one could be wrong. Maybe two or three of them conspired and they forged the hadith. But hundreds of companions from different backgrounds, they're not even related to each other. They just suddenly decided to come up with the story of Ghadir? Impossible. So in Usul al-Din, you need Yaqeen, right? But in Usul al-Fiqh, you don't really need Yaqeen. If you have one hadith that's authentic, it's enough proof between you and Allah. Just like the details of Salah. The details of Salah, do you need Hundreds of hadith for each detail? No. The marja looks at the books, he sees one correct hadith, and he'll give you the fatwa about how to do the salah, about the doubts of salah, about the details of hajj. All of that does not require 100% yaqeen. As long as you have one valid, authentic hadith, you can depend on it. But those early scholars, because they confused usul al deen which is the aqeedah and the belief system, with usul al-fiqh, which is legal theory, they would say you need full yaqeen for some of these common, you know, anasr al-mushtaraka, common elements for some of these principles. And this created a problem. So the author is saying, why did this happen? He's like, because they confused the two sciences. Or sometimes they would bring ideas from theology and they would discuss it in legal theory. And today you're sitting like, okay, what does this have to do with legal theory? This is a, a philosophical, theological discussion. And the author gives some examples. The, re the reason is very simple. The reason is that at that time, usul, legal theory, was still not a separate science. It was part of fiqh, it was part of usul al deen it was part of these other sciences. Later on when the scholars started to analyze the science, they developed it into a separate science, as we have it today. Today it's a separate science. But initially it was not, it was in its infancy stages. So this is what you find in page 27. And he gives a few examples from 
you know, previous scholars like Sayyid al-Murtaba in his book al dhariya how he would talk about this issue. And he would say that we see some scholars, they're bringing ideas from theology and inserting it into the science and it has nothing to do with it. So he's kind of frustrated. <laughs> but the reason for that is because it was not a separate science. Now when we go to the following page, we see that the author continues to speak about the evolution of usul until we reach the time of al-Shaykh al tusi You'll find in the second to last paragraph in Kitab al-Udda. Kitab al-Udda was one of its kind. It was probably the most important work on usul in that period. Where al-Shaykh al tusi in his book, he talks about usul as a separate science and he clearly differentiates it from fiqh and Islamic law. In the book of Al-Udda, we're talking about a thousand years ago. So we see scholars like at tusi who actually sat down and they developed the science and realized there is, you know, this is a separate science, let's treat it as a separate science. And he mentions a lot of principles that today are discussed in legal theory. So as Shaykh al tusi had really one of the biggest impacts on legal theory. He accelerated the evolution of legal theory and the development of it as a separate science. And until today, scholars benefit from his book. It's called Al-Udda, it's in Arabic of course. Now in the next chapter, we see that the author speaks about another interesting reason why the science of usul or legal theory developed. Now in the foreword, as, you, as you've noticed in this course and the previous course, we're looking at the history of usul because we should know how the science developed. This is important in understanding the science. Then inshallah we'll get to these details and we'll examine these common elements which is very interesting. But for now the author is still, you know, uh, speaking about the historical evolution of Alm al usul So in the following heading, you'll see that the author says the historical necessity for usul. The summary of what he says in this page is that one main reason why later scholars, later companions needed usul was that there was a gap between them and the time of the Prophet and the Imams. It is this gap that made it necessary for us to have a science called legal theory. How so? The author gives an example. He says if you lived at the time of the Prophet, you saw him with your own eyes, you heard everything that he said. Did you really need to go and study which hadith is authentic, which hadith is not authentic? How do I examine a senad or a chain of narrators if there's conflicting hadith? Did you need all this science? No, you didn't. You go to the Prophet, you hear him, you act upon what he said. Very simple. Did you have to go and examine, you know, and, and say, you know what, the Prophet, when he said this uh, command, uh, was it a binding command? Was it a recommendation? What word exactly did he use? Not really because you heard the exact word of the Prophet, you know in what context he said it, with what tone he said it. All that was available for you. Now, go a century later where you lost all those clues, that context. And remember the books, the, for example the Kafi, the book of Kafi, the hadiths of the Imams, are these the exact same words of the Imam? Or this is the narrator, what he understood and what he wrote for us. Not all of it is the exact word of the Imam. Some of it is paraphrased. A lot of it is paraphrased. You go, you have a discussion with the Imam. When you come out of the discussion, you write, you document it. But a lot of it is your own words, you're paraphrasing. But the point is when you paraphrase, some, sometimes you lose some subtle points, right? Whereas if you yourself were present there and you heard the Prophet, nobody is paraphrasing for you, you directly hear the Prophet. So now if you lived at the time of the Prophet, you really didn't need legal theory. Because everything was clear to you. In what context was it said, with what tone, what wording. 
there's no discrepancy. But once you come after the time of the Prophet and the Imams, you have a gap. Imam Sadiq when he said this hadith, how did he say it? In what circumstances? What did he mean by it? Are these his exact words or was the narrator paraphrasing? This all makes a big difference in how you understand the, the hadith. That's why you needed legal theory. So one reason why this became necessary was this historical gap. Let me give you one example. When you open some of our books, you see a hadith that says, Al-waladu wa maluhu li abi. Does anyone know Arabic to translate for us what this phrase means? The son. What does mal mean? Assets, wealth. Assets, wealth, whatever you own, your belongings. The son and whatever he owns, li abi. It's for his father. Now you as a scholar, you want to issue a fatwa. You have a hadith in our books. It's a correct hadith. It's from the Prophet, from the Imams. What does this hadith mean? According to Islamic law, a father owns everything that his son owns, right? So if you have $10,000 cash, your dad owns it too. He could take from it, he could spend it however he wishes. According to this hadith, right? And you as a scholar, you will issue a fatwa. All you sons out there and daughters, your parents, your father, they could take your money anytime they want. Now if you look at this sentence in itself, you can issue such a fatwa. However, when you go research how the Prophet said it, he was answering what question, he was addressing what case, you realize that's not what the Prophet meant. When you read the story of it, what was the story of it? A man comes to the Prophet, he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, my father is being oppressive, he's taking my money. The Prophet told him, go get your father. His father came, the Prophet told, told, told him, is that true? Are you taking money from your son without his permission? He told him, Ya Rasulullah, I raised my own son when I was poor. I raised him, I spent on him from my own money. And now I'm unemployed, I'm starving to death, and I have to support my family. When my, my son has some money, sometimes I will take some money from him to spend on him and my family, on everyone. In that case, the Prophet, peace be upon him, looked at the son. He gave him moral advice and he told him, look, you and everything that you own is for your father. This is not a legal order or command, it's a moral command. The Prophet is telling him, sh how shame on you, your father who raised you, and now he's unemployed, he's starving, he has no food. You're not willing to give him some money, and the father said, I just take some money just so I don't starve. The Prophet was rebuking him, you know, shame on you for you to come and complain. You should take care of your father. So the Prophet is not making a general legal command here that all of you sons and whatever you own belongs to your father. No, the Prophet is giving moral advice. Aib alayk, you know, shame on you. Why should you complain from your father when he's taking some money? Now when you look at the story and the context of it, it becomes clear what the Prophet meant. This is a very basic example by the way. We have very complex examples in Islamic law. Now if you were present at the time of the Prophet, would you have this confusion? No, everything's clear to you, you saw exactly what happened. When you come later centuries and you see the scholars have mentioned one line and you don't know the story behind it, you have to search and sometimes you find in other uh, books uh, the story behind it, then you realize, you know what, this is not what it meant, it means something else. So this historical gap is what really, uh, is what necessitates for us to study usul. Because then you get contradictions like that. One hadith says, no, you only own your belongings. Your dad doesn't own anything. One hadith says, whatever you own, it's your dad's. You have a contradiction here. But when you examine the context of that first hadith, there is no contradiction. It's just a moral, you know, command from the Prophet. So, that's what the author discusses uh, pretty much in this uh, chapter. Inshallah we will continue.
uh, next week and we will finish the introduction and the foreword and we will begin with the definition of Alm al usul and we'll discuss some of these common elements. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.